brought to you by Charity Mobile, the phone company that shares your values. More information is available at CharityMobile.com. We have an interesting letter that popped up over the weekend. The bishops of the Nordic Conference of Catholic Bishops issued a kindly and charitably worded letter to the to Bishop Botzing of the German Conference of Bishops, and of course to his brother bishops, it's full of kind words thanking the Catholics of Germany for all the help that they provided to the restoration of the church in the Nordic countries after the Reformation. But its purpose is to remind the German bishops that they are on the brink of falling into total heresy and all the theological depravity that goes with it. For all the kindness of the letter, it's actually pretty brutal if you actually pay close attention. There's a lot of subtle accusations being made that are only blunted by the kind words the bishops chose to wrap them in. The Nordic bishops refer to the German synodal process as an emptying of the deposit of the faith, an impoverishment of Catholicism as a bankruptcy of the faith. They have taken the old idea that a spoonful of sugar helps the, all the bitter things go down. These bishops join the growing ranks of bishops from around the world who have decided to intervene in the German synodal way which is openly rejecting the truth of Catholicism. So keep all the bishops here in your prayers. They definitely need it. I have some thoughts on this at the end, because all we've gotten is writing so far, and it may be time for more than just letters. But here, here's the letter from the Nordic bishops to the Germans. The letter of the Nordic Bishops' Conference addressed to the German bishops. Excellency, dear confrères, like the German Bishops' Conference, the Nordic one is also meeting this week for the Spring General Assembly. We send you warm greetings from Tromose. We accompany you and all German confrères with our prayer for the meeting in Versailles and for the social and pastoral everyday life, which is becoming increasingly difficult at this time. Much connects the Catholics of our countries with the Catholic Church in Germany. The post-Reformation restoration of Catholic faith life in Germany is largely due to the Catholics in Germany. Several bishops, many priests, countless women religious have generously dedicated themselves to the mission in the North. Through their testimonies of Christ and their love for the Church, they created what we are building on today. Added to this is the financial help that remains the basis for Church life in the Nordic countries to this day. For everything a hearty, God bless you. The challenges facing the church worldwide are overwhelming. Of course, it is imperative that we as bishops consider how best to approach them in order to remain faithful to Christ, to meet the needs of the people of our day, and to communicate the truth of the faith. However, we are concerned about the direction, methodology, and content of the synodal path of the church in Germany. We see that the felt need for changes must be seen against the background of the concrete situation in Germany. At the same time, neither the issues nor the outcome of the deliberations hoped for by some are not purely German concerns. We all must and want to heal the terrible wounds of the Ted McCarrick situation. It is imperative that the suffering of the victims be acknowledged. Everything must be done to prevent this in the future. It is about justice, a Christian imperative. It is also about the credibility of the Church. The Holy Father synodally calls for the whole Church to search together for life-giving potential in the life and work of the Church today. This process calls for a radical conversion. First, we must rediscover and share the promises of Jesus as a source of joy, freedom, and prosperity. Our task is to fully embrace, with gratitude and reverence, the depositum fide mediated by the Church. Many believers around the world are concerned about the lifestyle of priests and their training, the position of women in the Church, the breadth of conceptions of marital relations, etc. In the legitimate search for answers to such questions of our time, we must stop at these topics which contain unchanging portions of church doctrine. True reforms of the church have always consisted in defending, explaining, and putting into credible practice the Catholic teaching founded on divine revelation and authentic tradition, not in following the spirit of the times. How fleeting the zeitgeist is confirmed daily. The worldwide synodal process has generated great expectations. We all hope for a renewal of the church life, church mission. However, there is a risk that we will turn the church into a project, the object of our actions, through process thinking and structural restructuring. The synodal process presupposes the image of the church as the pilgrim people of God. Such a people must organize themselves sensibly, that is clear, 
but people of God is only one of the images that tradition uses to describe the nature of the church. If our synodal discerning is to bear fruit, it must be enriched and oriented by these other dimensions. It seems essential to us, especially at this moment, to bring the sacramental mystery of the church to the fore. How do we manage now to consider with amazement? and to experience, that the church is also the corpus mysticum, the bride of Christ, and the mediator of grace. The church cannot only be defined as a visible society, it is a mystery of communion, communion of humanity with the triune God, communion of believers among themselves, communion of the local churches worldwide with the successor of Peter. It is our experience that the Catholics who shape and sustain the life of our parishes and communities are intuitively aware of this sacramental mystery but are not always inclined to fill out questionnaires or participate in debates. Let us not forget, in the context of the synodal process, to also listen carefully to their testimonies. Especially at a time when Europe is threatening to split through deep fissures, one thing is certain. We need a higher criterion of unity. Christ alone is our hope. In his name the Church is called to be the indestructible nucleus of unity, hope, and salvation for the whole human race. See Lumen Gentium, paragraph 9. Only if we base our ecclesial life ad intra on Christ and live for the fullness of his revelation will we be able to live up to his, this vocation. It is hardly the case that an impoverishment of the content of the faith will lead to a new fullness of ecclesiastical vitality. In the midst of the current crisis, the church in Germany still has the potential to renew itself. Of this, we are convinced. As on the first day of the gospel, we are called to radical conversion and holiness. We commemorate with gratitude the great German saints, the theologians who have wonderfully enriched us, as well as the crowds of German missionaries who were sent all over the world and who worked humbly and inconspicuously. We are deeply grateful for the generosity of German Catholics who have ministered to needs and encouraged development. Abundant blessings will continue to spring from that legacy today. So we hope and pray that the faith that has been handed down and the life in Christ that mercifully transforms us will again and continue to be secured by the Church, even in a society undergoing tremendous change. We wish you and all the confreres of the German Bishops' Conference the courage and hope to maintain unity. We remain fraternally connected to you in this great task. We confidently recommend the Church in Germany, especially to the intercession of Mary, Mother of the Church. With best wishes for a blessed Lent, signed the various bishops of the Nordic Bishops' Conference, as well as a couple of priests and nuns. That was definitely an interesting letter, and it's available at my sources site at returntotradition.org. That's the name of this podcast with a .org at the end. Just look for the post with this podcast title in it, and you'll find it without any real effort. It's linked there, but it's in Norse, so you're going to need to do what I had to do, which is run it through a translating processor like Google Translate or something. But the message that they sent is loud and clear for anyone with eyes to see and ears to hear. While the various bishops who have tried to intervene aren't free of their own modernist tendencies, they certainly aren't, the moderate modernists are trying desperately to stop the fringe elements in the Church of the New Advent from capsizing the ship of the Church. That seems obvious. The entire test for the Church to see if modernism can be embraced is clearly running into rather predictable outcome of 60 years of innovation. The most radical elements are having a field day under the reign of the man who is the living, breathing embodiment of the spirit of Vatican II. If the various better bishops had seen this for what it is, then maybe they'd have come to that same conclusion about the council that many of us louder voices have in recent years. And they need to come to that conclusion so they can do something about this. See, my only issue with this is that a lot of the bishops have written letters to the German bishops while still running synods in their own countries and individual dioceses. Maybe, and here's a novel idea, maybe they should first and foremost stop this synodal process in their own dioceses and conferences and try to take concrete action to stop the German conference of bishops from what they're doing. And they need to confront Francis about all this because several months ago, he endorsed in writing their synodal process, meaning he tacitly approves of everything that they're doing. His plan is to issue a document in 2023 or 2024, an encyclical, that is moderate by comparison, but still radical. And so he couldn't be happier with what they're doing. We need to c some concrete action from the bishops. It's time. Yes, I like these letters, but we need more than just letters at this point. Now, what did you think of all this? Let me know in the comments, please. Should the Nordic bishops have taken a tone similar to Cardinals Mueller and Brandmuller, 
when they called out the German bishops for the heresies they were promoting, when they, those bishops actually used the word heresy in their correction? Or is it better that these bishops be diplomatic? Let me know in the comments, please, and like and subscribe if you haven't. It really does help. As always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria.